So here's uh, the assignment. Please do read the book. There's a lot of great stuff in the book. We'll do the example problem. We'll try to get to that before the bell rings and work these problems as homework um, as soon as you can. And then uh, let's today let's review kinematics. And then we're going to talk about um, angular position, velocity, and acceleration. And then we'll talk about constant angular acceleration. And what we're going to find here is this. We're going to come up with a, a set of basically kinematic equations for objects that are rotating about a fixed axis. And we're going to find that the, those equations are just about exactly like the kinematic equations for linear motion. So let's talk about uh, linear motion for a second. So linear motion. Now, let's just restrict um, the review here to um, a single dimension, the x-axis. So you have the x-axis. And the first thing we did on our x-axis is we identified a position. And we said, hey, where is the position? Well. It's a vector that describes where the object is, reference to the origin. And if the object was moving, maybe this is the initial position. And then we have a final position. And if I say x final minus x initial, I get another vector like this. And I called this delta x. This is how much the position changed. When I took that delta x and divide it by delta t, I called that velocity. So this was position. This was a change in position. When I divided the change in position by time, I got velocity. Then I allow, uh, took a limit. And, I, and actually, this is average velocity right here. But if I took the limit of delta t as it went to 0 of delta x over delta t, this gave me a ratio of, you know, of change in position over change in time that was instantaneous. That is, what is the velocity at a certain instant in time? We call that dx dt. Of course, we can do the same thing in the y-axis and the z-axis, and then we can combine them all to be moving in three-dimensional space, which we did. If, if I'm changing my velocity, um, I defined uh, average acceleration to be um, delta v over delta t. OK. And then, um, if I took the limit of this, this would be instantaneous acceleration, would be the limit as delta t goes to 0 of delta v over delta t, which was dv dt. OK. And so you know, we spent quite a bit of time, worked a lot of problems dealing with these definitions of position, velocity, and acceleration. Then what we did is we said, hey, what, what's true if acceleration is a constant? Well, if the acceleration is a constant, what does that mean? Well, if I graph velocity as a function of time, that means this is a straight line because the slope is delta v over delta t here. So if a is constant, we got v equals v naught plus a t. And remember, this is just the equation of a straight line. y equals mx plus b. And then we said, uh, well, the area underneath this graph is displacement. OK, delta x is the area underneath that graph. And the area of this, this is just a trapezoid. And the area of a trapezoid is the average base times the height. It's a trapezoid on its side. Then we made a substitution of for final velocity into this equation and simplified it. And we got the third kinematic equation. And then um, we solved the first kinematic equation for time 
uh, plugged it in here and simplified and rearranged and got the fourth kinematic equation. Okay, so this is a review of stuff we did quite a long time ago. Okay, well, this was all for linear motion. And what we mean by linear motion is the object is moving along a straight line in this case. Or if it's moving in two or three dimensional space, the object is translating. And we're also treating an object like an airplane or a person or, or whatever object is moving, we're treating it as if it's a particle, right? We, we just draw a dot and represent the object as a dot. Um, well, now we're going, we're not going to do that. Um, if, because we know that if we have an object, okay, maybe this dot, let's expand it out, maybe this object is the Earth. Now what do we know about the Earth? Well, the Earth moves around the Sun, that is, it translates. So, or it moves in a linear fashion, it actually, the, the line <laughs> turns into a curve, a circle around the Sun, but it translates. The whole thing moves as one. But we also know that the Earth spins on its axis, doesn't it? So what, we're, what we've got here is two kinds of motion. We've got what we call translational motion. That's moving the whole object from one place to another, and now we're going to have rotational motion. So let's talk about rotational motion. So rotational motion. Okay, now let's come up with uh, some kind of general object. A blob, here's our, our amoeba. Now, what we need is an axis system. Now, let's say that this object is going to um, rotate. You know what? Hold on a second. Let's put the axis of rotation on the object itself. It doesn't have to be, but... So here's my x-axis and here's my y-axis like this. And what we're going to say is here at the origin, this object is going to rotate around this, uh, this point right here. And it's going to stay in the sheet. Now what it's going to do, it's going to go like this. It's going to rotate around like that. Now the axis won't rotate, but the object will. So the object is spinning around a fixed axis. Well, let's take a look at a point that's on this object. And here is its, the position of that. Okay, there's R, initial. Now, if we rotate this a certain distance, or a certain, you know, angle, this rotates, R is the same, isn't it? The, the magnitude of R, it's the same distance away from the origin. Okay, but it did move from here over to here. And um, we need a way of, of, of explaining, you know, what's going on here. Uh, of describing where this object is if it's, um, if it's spinning. So let's get even simpler here. Let's move off the object and just look at a single point. Here's my object in space. Now, I'm going to give it, here's that point, I just moved it down here. It has what we call an angular position. That is, where is it in terms of, of, of the x-axis here? And we're going to call that theta. And that is its angular position. Now, if the object if, if this object right here rotates on its axis, then this object is going to be over here. 
So this is its initial angular position. But over here is its final angular position. So this is theta initial right here. Let me move this up. And this is theta final. Now, obviously, we change the angular position of this object by this much, right? I mean, we were here at this angle, and now we're at this angle, so this is the difference. So what we can do is describe uh, what we call an angular displacement. That is delta theta. And delta theta uh, is equal to theta final minus theta initial. Now this can be in degrees or radians or even you know revolutions, whatever whatever uh, unit of angle you want to use is fine. Okay. Um, now all I'm going to do is repeat what we did um, before. It took time for this object to rotate from he here up to here. So if we divide the uh, angular displacement by time, we get angular or average angular velocity. So we're going to define this as, it looks like a W, doesn't it? It's not a W. Uh, one of the things we, we try to do is we try to use uh, Greek letters uh, for angular stuff. And so this is a theta. This is an omega. OK? It's not a w. And so we're going to define that to be delta theta over delta t. Or if we want the instantaneous angular velocity, we're going to take the limit as delta t goes to 0 of delta theta over delta t. Now, I want to talk about the direction of this for a little bit. Um, are these vectors? Is, is theta a vector? Well, that's a good that's a good instinct it's it's not a vector like we've been thinking about in terms of um, you know a magnitude and a direction I mean a spatial direction but it does have an orientation in space if I take this eraser right here okay and I I try to rotate it like this, okay? That's a different rotation, isn't it, than if I have it turned like this and I rotate it like this, okay? So what we need is we need an axis of rotation that we all agree with, that we all understand, and we need to identify what is that axis of rotation. So here's what we do. Obviously, our object that's rotating um, is oriented like this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say this. I'm going to take my right hand, and it's the right hand rule. Okay? And what we're going to do is we're going to say, look, if this object is rotating from here to here, I take my right hand, and now it's totally arbitrary that we chose the right hand. I'm sorry, left-handers, you, you know. Actually, you have an advantage because you can do your work while using the right-hand rule. <laughs> By the way, I've actually had right-handed students get exactly the wrong answer because they're using their left hand to figure stuff out, and their answer is the opposite sign of what they should get. But anyway, what you do is you take your hand and you sweep it in the direction of the change in, in angle. And your thumb, which is pointed right at the camera now, is the direction of the vector, in quotes, of the uh, change in angular position. Now, 
So I would say delta theta in this case, if it goes from here over to here, I would sweep my right hand like this. My thumb is pointing out of the paper. And in that case, I would say delta theta, this is the magnitude, maybe it's like 10 degrees or something, in the k hat direction. I'll zoom, I'll zoom back in. Ah, this is all I see without my glasses right here. Just be patient. That's it. Wow, she gained some sympathy. That's amazing. All right, now, that won't help you in your future career. All right, now, um, <laughs> delta theta in the k-hat direction. Now, what does this direction mean? It really tells you the orientation of the axis that you're rotating around. It says, hey, your axis of rotation is pointed up in the, in the k-hat direction. And if it's positive, we've decided to make positive a counterclockwise sweep. Uh, if it's negative, it's a negative, I mean not negative, it's a clockwise uh, sweep. And um, so th that's kind of where the vector nature of rotate, uh, rotating quantities comes from. It's really identifying the direction of the axis of rotation. And it can be kind of confusing. Um, sometimes I think these are called pseudo vectors or something like that because they don't really, they don't totally obey uh, the laws of vector addition and stuff like that. But you need to, you obviously need to identify what your axis of rotation, where it is and how it's pointed and how you're spinning compared to that axis of rotation if you're going to describe how something is, you know, spinning. Now, getting back to angular velocity, this has units of usually radians per second or degrees per second or revolutions per second or per minute or, you know, we'll, we'll talk about um, units here in a little bit. I assume everybody here is really familiar with what a radian is and uh, read the book. They kind of give you a little review of what a radian is, but I, I don't have time to go over that now. Now, hey, you can change your angular velocity though, right? Like if I have my eraser right here, um, it can spin faster and faster and faster and faster and faster, you know, so um, we can have a changing rate of angular velocity. And of course we call that angular acceleration. So we have, and we use alpha to describe that. So alpha means angular acceleration. And by definition, average, this little bar here means it's an average, is just delta omega over delta t. And are these vectors, well, they do have an orientation in space. They do have an axis of rotation. All the problems that we're going to do in this class, this semester, throughout the whole problem, the axis of rotation is fixed. It's not going to change with time. If you want to get into, involved in a system where the axis of rotation changes with time, it's extremely complicated. And someday you might do it but not in this class, okay? This is gonna be complicated enough. So obviously, the instantaneous angular acceleration is the limit as delta t goes to zero of delta omega over delta t. Okay? Now, I want you to notice something. Um, over here, we previously, we, we went through exactly the same mathematical analysis to, when we talked about translational motion or linear motion. This is exactly the same. All we've done is a variable change, really. So what that means is that if we say, if we uh, let the angular acceleration, if we let alpha in radians per second square or degrees per second squared 
or revolutions per second squared. If we let that equal a constant, well, we're going to get um, exactly um, the same equations, uh, kinematic equations for rotational motion. So instead of V equals V naught plus A T, if we go through exactly the same math, we say, well, our final angular velocity, if our angular acceleration is a constant, it's going to be equal to our initial angular velocity plus our angular acceleration times time. It's alpha. You can do whatever you want. All right. Now, these are called analogous variables. There's uh, linear motion and rotational motion are, are sometimes the, are, are thought of as analogous. That is, if you make, because they have the same mathematical derivation, um, they're, you're going to end up with the same equations. If we have you know, delta x equals v plus v naught over t, oh, over 2, I'm sorry, times time, delta theta equals omega plus omega naught over 2 times time. Notice that time, there's no such thing as rotational time. It's just time. And and watch the fabric of the cosmos, uh, their episode on time. It was on last night. It was incredible. It was amazing. So here's delta x, here's delta theta, v, v naught, analogous. So, um, and we can just do the same thing for the third kinematic equation. I can say delta theta is equal to omega naught times t plus one half alpha t squared. And I can say omega squared is equal to omega naught squared plus two alpha delta theta. In other words, we've got these kinematic equations that we've been using for tr translational motion, you know, since late August. Well, now we can use the same equations for rotational motion if we have the same uh, idea that, you know, hey, the angular acceleration is a constant. So let's do an example problem using, you know, these, uh, you know, involving constant angular acceleration. And what I'd like to do here is this is uh, So So anyway, um, so if, if we take a look at example uh, 10.1 in your book right here, it says a wheel rotates with a constant angular acceleration of 3.5 radians per second squared. <laughs> If the angular speed of the wheel is 2 radians per second at t equals 0, through uh, what angular displacement does the wheel rotate in 2 seconds? So these are exactly like the kinematic problems that we worked earlier in the year. So for example, 10.1 on page 297. Here's what's given. A wheel rotates with a constant angular acceleration of 3.5. So alpha equals 3.50 radians per second. Um, if the angular speed of the wheel is 2 radians per second, so omega naught equals 2 radians 
for second at oh thank you at, at, at t equals zero um, and then we want oh, I didn't need to write that um, so t final is going to be uh, two seconds so we just want to find at least for part a we want to find the final angular velocity so this is really easy okay um, uh, what angular oh I'm sorry for a we don't want to find omega we want to find delta theta because it says um, if the angular speed of the wheel is 2 radians per second at t equals 0 through what angular displacement does the wheel rotate in 2 seconds so let's solve so you say well um, what do I know alpha omega naught t and delta theta well what am I not given I'm not given the final angular velocity and I'm not trying to find it so I'm going to use the third kinematic equation which is delta theta equals omega naught t plus one half alpha t squared now the beauty of this is if you have an equation list you almost don't have to add these you know if you know the variables are analogous if you know the linear equations you know the rotational equations so delta theta is equal to omega naught is two radians per second oops times time two seconds plus one half 3.50 radians per second squared times 2 seconds squared if you do the arithmetic uh, you will get 11 radians right this is 4 plus right, so it's 11 radians now I would like you to do part B and C for this uh, example problem but that's what we're doing so actually this stuff that we're doing right now it's it's, it's going to be uh, pretty easy so go through it you know stay caught up and uh, that's it